Okay, well, I um, guess I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so, before I get started uh, properly, let me um, just uh, kind of take a uh, uh, kind of status of where we're at here. So we've got this week and next week. Um, so we're going to be looking at just two more uh, chapters, two more units for a textbook. Um, so, I mean, as usual, I'll talk about the um, assignment that we just completed, and then we'll look at the uh, the um, unit here that we're working on this week. Um, so we've got, um, what, this is like chapter 16 on um, processor structure and front function um, that we're looking at here. And then we'll look at the reduced instruction set next week um, um, to, to wrap up things. So, um, and then we're gonna have our second test um, during finals week. It'll be pretty much the similar format to the um, first test. Um, I mean, in theory it is comprehensive, but it's mostly gonna be um, over the materials since test one. So probably it's gonna be questions like, uh, yeah, maybe something on digital, digital logic or on, um, you know, Boolean expressions or something like that from that problem set would be some good kinds of questions or maybe computer arithmetic. So, you know, the format, floating point format or um, the, uh, the boost algorithm for multiplication maybe or things like that. Um, so, you know, basically looking at a good thing to review would be to look at the problem sets, especially the ones that we had since test one, when you start thinking about test two, so. And so would, would it also include like assembly language and the like? Yeah, so that's all right. And, and including the stuff that we did uh, last week and this week and next week. So I don't know if there'll be a question on assembly language. That was a pretty small chapter, but, uh, but yeah, um, but, um, but yeah, for this uh, this week, um, pipelining questions of what we'll talk a little bit about here in a second might might make good questions on the test or similar things to similar things to the problem set questions that we've got this week would definitely be good to review. So. And uh, did you specify again uh, when the final would be? Like finals would it uh, span uh, several days? Would it be? Yeah, I, I, I'll open it up the same like we did for the first test. So um, uh, let me see here. And uh, the only reason I ask is uh, because I, I plan on traveling abroad next, uh, next week. Yeah, it'll be open for a couple of days. So I can't remember exactly what we did, um, uh, how many days we had it open, but I'll probably do the same thing, but over finals week. So, um, okay. well, we had it open uh, a couple of days, the 21st through the 24th. So what was that? That was, um, uh, but I could be some, I'd be flexible. So yeah, if people need some extra stuff on that. So was, I'll probably do it um, so much. So yeah, I, I opened it up on Thursday and gave it all the way through the weekend. Oh, well, yeah, I guess I can't do exactly that because our finals is, is, is done before that, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll open up like Wednesday to Friday or something like that and see if that works for people. So um, to, to at least have about the same number of days. Um, um, but yeah, I was planning on opening up for two or three days, probably at the end of the week. So. But it'll be, say, it'll have like a time limit though. So once you start it, you'll have to answer the questions during that time limit and do the same kind of thing as before. Um, I'll try and talk more about that uh, next week during our last help session too. So I haven't, I haven't made up the questions yet, but um, um, I'll set it, uh, I'll set the dates specifically before then, and, um, and maybe we'll talk more about it um, next Wednesday as well. So. Um, all right, yeah. So, but yeah, that's coming up. Um, Okay, so uh, like I said in the announcement, um, um, I think, I, I mean, I, I'll go over the problem set 11 here, but 
probably won't spend too much time on this um, because most people had didn't have really any problems with this, I think. Um, so I mean, if there's questions on this, uh, you guys can ask it. Um, so there is an example solution posted on this. Um, uh, I mean, a few people did get the first question wrong, only, but it was only like two or three at most. Um, so um, basically, I mean, you know, you had to kind of maybe had to go back and look at a uh, previous chapter actually kind of to know what that the C status flag was, that's the carry flag. So that's basically gonna be one if a borrow happens or um, not overflow, but um, 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 if the result of like an addition is too big. So, so kind of in either case there is where the carry would be set. So, I mean, in this case, basically the addition shouldn't have caused a carry unless you only have like two or three bits here because the result six would fit. Um, um, into you know even even a single byte so so there should be no problem for doing the addition but whenever you do a subtraction you're actually kind of borrowing um, so you would have the carry set the carry flag set to one um, on the subtraction here so um, so likewise for two oh, well I did um, Again, there's only three or four, I think, people, maybe a few more, but um, um, a couple of people on, on two, a couple of students were only really describing what the, the, the Z um, status flag and the, um, the um, sign flag and the overflow flag were, but then weren't really addressing the actual problem. So you got a point or two off if you're kind of in that camp on this one. So, I mean, this was pretty similar to a question on the previous problem set or, or, or the one before the previous one. So about the same idea. So really on this one, I was looking for, you know, the compare instruction works by subtracting these. Um, and if you're subtracting a sign integer, um, um, so kind of in the question description, it was given that um, for, for the greater than um, you're going to end up with the sign and the overflow being equal um, when you do this subtraction. So for less than, you're gonna end up with those being unequal, but you had to kind of just uh, at least give some description of why that is. So why that is, um, 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 we, we talked about this in a similar way um, on a previous problem set. So, Basically, when you do that subtraction for signed integers, either um, the result is going to be valid. So for if it's less than, uh, you're going to ex expect that the result is negative. So you're going to get a sign of one. Um, and you know if, if the subtraction is still going to fit, um, uh, the overflow won't occur. But you can also have values where if you do a subtraction, the, the result won't fit in the original size, however many bits you have for the subtraction. So in that case, um, overflow will occur. So o, o, the O flag, O status register will be one, but the result because of the overflow will look like it's not negative, even though um, it should be, uh, the, the, the actual value is negative but um, you don't get a negative result. So, so in both cases, you end up with the sign flag not being equal to the overflow um, flag. So. Um, or did I have that rebirth? So, so yeah, yeah, so maybe I was describing the, the less than there. So, um, But, uh, but yeah, reading back over this, I guess for less than, you should get those that they're not equal. Yeah, and, and for greater than, um, uh, you'll end up getting those being equal to each other. And, and in all cases, I mean, another thing that people probably should have mentioned is that, um, you know, only the, the zero flag can only be set when, when they're equal, right? So if you do a comparison, you do a subtraction, uh, the result will be zero, so you'll get the zero flag being set. But if it's less than or greater than, 
um, the subtraction will re result in a value that's not zero, so the zero flag wouldn't be set, right? So, so there's three kinds of distinct cases there that can be um, and then likewise, so, I mean, there, there's lots of ways that people could have been doing the, um, oh, um, yeah, I'm skipping over. So three was pretty easy. I think everybody got that one. So, um, I mean, really the, the result of the first two of, of the putting zero into this register and then comparing them, um, um, the, the result is always going to be equal since, I mean, and in fact, whatever you put into AL, if you compare it, um, the result should be equal. Right, um, so you could have put one in there or any value. But anyway, so um, um, since they're always equal, th this ends up just being an absolute jump, as most people said. You know, so so you know, these statements before here mean that we're always going to jump to the next uh, to the address that's pointed to by next here. So so you might as well just replace all three of those with an absolute jump to next instead of uh, doing that manipulation. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there, there, there could have been lots of ways that you could have done four and five. Um, I should have um, um, actually gave an example of these programs to compile them and run them in GNU assembly, but um, I ran out of time. But um, so the basic, you know, for the first one is um, I, I had a couple of variations on here. Um, people were doing things more complex than you really needed to. Um, so um, at, at its heart, you needed to have something set aside for the the variables. So you know, a, a more straightforward C compiler would look at these four variable declarations and would end up reserving memory. Um, so at or well, you know, actually, since this is a function call, these would end up being reserved on the stack. But uh, if you're writing this by hand, translating this as a function, you would probably do something like use the, um, um, uh, the, the directives to reserve some memory or to, or to reserve some memory with a particular value in it, uh, which was talked about in this chapter here. Uh, and then from that, you know, um, in this example solution that I had, I, I used one of the registers. I mean, we could have like, um, um, uh, Say, for example, we could have uh, another variation would be to say move zero into the average and then add I1, I2, and add three to average. Um, but of course, that would be a little bit less efficient because um, if you're using a memory address instead of a register, uh, you're going to have to, you know read both of those values into the CPU, do the addition, and then write it out back out to memory. Whereas if you're using a register, um, you don't have to go out to memory to put the result in there. So, so uh, doing adds um, into registers is gonna be a bit more efficient than doing uh, adds where the, the target, you know, the, the, um, the result operand goes back out into memory somewhere, you know, like back out to average or whatever temporary location where you were using to add up these three values. So. But um, people did it um, both ways, you know, either using a register or um, um, adding the things directly out to like average or some, or some memory address like that. And then you have to do some kind of a division. So um, in this case, there is an integer division um, machine instruction, which makes the most sense here since we're adding integers um, and, and representing these as integers. So you actually have to do something a bit more complex in an assembly language program to do some floating point arithmetic here, so kind of avoiding that. I don't think anybody really kind of tried to do that uh, uh, either. So, um, but yeah, if you do an integer division, you'll get the, the um, approximation of the average of the, you know, the whole number, the closest whole number result here. Um, yeah, likewise for five, I 
yeah, so I can't remember um, if anybody got any points off on five or not. Um, but um, again, there's multiple ways people could have done this. Um, but um, you have to do something like um, um, compare that register to zero. Um, and most people were, were jumping um, if it was equal. So, so doing the else part. Um, so here I'm doing a little bit closer to the if else statement. So if it's not equal, I jump over to an else label um, to do this part to, to move two into the EBX register. Um, so if, it, if, if EAX is equal to zero, uh, instead we fall through this, we, we don't do the conditional jump and we do the, 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 the then part um, to move one into EBX. And that, but, um, you know, the one difference, this, this is typical how code like um, this would get compiled into assembly, right? So, so here, in order to implement a condition statement like this, uh, a, a then, if then, or, or else, uh, you have to do the then part. Um, so you have to be careful to jump over the else part explicitly, right? So, so high level code like this ends up being a little bit more spaghetti kind of code on the uh, assembly uh, language level, right? So, so we have to carefully jump past the else part if we were doing the then, um, or we have to jump into the else part. Uh, and then in that case, we can fall through to the to the code after the if else statements. So um, all right, yeah, like I said, I didn't really have a lot to say about that problem set. Um, uh, if anybody had questions about those, let me know. And then he has a little bit shorter than some of the other ones. So, uh, the, yeah, the, the current one for this one, uh, for number 12, um, will we'll take people a little bit longer, I'm sure, at least the, the last two of the four questions. Uh, okay. We'll see, so, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so I, I, Let's just move right into, um, I, I think I'll start by kind of maybe talking about a few things that will lead up to, I'm going to talk about the, the questions for the, uh, the 12 problem set. So yeah, I don't know if I'll go too long tonight here, we'll see. I'm still, um, yeah, I hope you guys all got a little bit of a break uh, um, uh, Thanksgiving here. So um, I'm still um, kind of getting back into things here for our last two, three weeks here, so personally. Yeah, the week after coming back from Thanksgiving. So <laughs> yeah. They could have, I don't know, maybe start the semester earlier, so after Thanksgiving, you know, so. Yeah, it's not a great, not a great period for a break with just uh, one or two more weeks to do so. Um, all right, so. Um, Um, yeah, before I talk about these, let, let me, um, I'll probably skip over the section one and two um, for our chapter here on um, on um, processor organization here. So, uh, so, you know, maybe I should mention it. So we are kind of starting the fifth sort of section of our textbook here, although um, I ended up we're not going to go through all these chapters on here. We're just going to go over the first two chapters of the uh, of the the materials about the central processing unit. If you get a chance, I mean the um, um, the the chapter eighteen is a good one too. You know, I mean, at least read a little bit about the superscalar processing uh, if you can while you're taking this. You know, uh, wrapping up this course. So um, there's lots of um, uh, things that are kind of good to know about um, uh, that stuff, but but we'll just look at this chap chapter sixteen and then the we'll talk a little bit about risk um, instruction sets uh, next week. So, um, so you know, I did want to mention a couple of things like about the um, uh, the instruction cycle. Um, so, you know, all the way back at the beginning of the course, we talked a little bit about the basic 
um, instruction cycle for a processor, right? So the, the idea of, you know, so CPUs are very mechanical, right? So, so you know, we, we just do, we fetch the next instruction and we execute it. And we just keep doing that over and over, right? Um, and there's some, there's certain um, um, conventions uh, that a process that the CPU follows, right? So by convention, uh, uh, we execute instructions sequentially. So every time we fetch an instruction, uh, we have some register that the, the program counter, which tells us the next instruction, location of the next instruction to fetch that we're gonna execute. And by convention, since we normally execute instructions sequentially, after the fetch cycle or as part of the fetch cycle, we will increment the, the program counter, right? So, so normally it just gets incremented to whatever the next instruction will be um, as part of or kind of after the fetch cycle. Um, I mean, that can get been affected by branch instructions or interrupts or things like that, but, um, uh, but our normal processing is to um, execute instructions sequentially, right? So we did, uh, in the previous chapter, we, we began expanding on that basic idea a little bit, you know, because we did talk a little bit about interrupts before. Um, we don't really revisit them too much here in this chapter, but um, part, in order to support interrupts at the hardware level, we normally, the, the CPU normally checks whether an interrupt is pending then, usually, usually at the end of each execution uh, in the fetch execute cycle. So, um, anyway, I mean, we're in this chapter, we're getting into um, looking at much more of, of you know, the details of, of what's happening um, uh, in the CPU, right? So, so I, I skipped over it, but, um, you know, um, um, you know, now we're looking at the internal components and the internal logic of the CPU. You know, so, so the, the control unit, the arithmetic logic unit, um, which would be kind of like subcomponents of the CPU, and kind of how they work. Um, so, I mean, most of the execution of the instructions is that that's the job of the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, the, that subcomponent of the CPU. But then these other things, um, the, the the fetching, um, and then also the expanding of operands and the fetching of operands, and then the the, the storing of results back to operands or back to memory. Um, those are kind of all part of the control unit function here. Um, so anyway, so I think this is a good. Um, diagram, the 16.4, um, to me, this kind of makes more sense. So, so now we're, we're beginning to look at a lot more of the gritty details of what a CPU might actually be doing, right? So, or, you know, we're, we're, another way to think of it is we're breaking down um, the basic fetch, execute, check for interrupts into finer grained kind of steps. And we do this for a purpose so that we can support pipelining or, well, CPU designers do it for a purpose um, to, uh, to be able to pipeline um, uh, instructions in order to increase the uh, processor efficiency. Um, um, so this is just, you know, generic, I mean, you know, particular CPUs like Intel or, or ARM-based CPUs uh, won't be doing exactly this. Uh, but conceptually, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be doing similar things, you know, so um, fetching the instruction, um, uh, decoding, say, you know, so an instruction will have one or two or maybe three operands. So, you know, we, we would we would have to, uh, um, well, we'd have to decode the instruction, but then we'd have to um, calculate the operand. So we talked about different addressing modes in, in uh, uh, chapter two or three back, right? So depending on if it's direct or indirect or one of the other kind of addressing modes, we'd have to um, um, calculate 
the actual effective address that we need to fetch for the operand, right? And then actually fetch the operand. And if we have two operands, we have, might have to do that multiple times, one for each of the operands that we have, or, or, or three operands, or however many operands we have. Um, so we have to do kind of all of that to get the data ready before we can actually execute the instruction. Um, so um, I guess that's what then the data operation is basically the execution, the, 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 operand, the, the operation instruction. Um, uh, uh, in this figure here. Um, and then, you know, once you're done with the results, you still have the final thing. You have to kind of store the results into the explicit or implied uh, um, location where the results should go. So depending on your machine architecture, um, that might be implied as one of the two operands that you have, or it might be explicitly stated like in a three uh, address uh, operand um, uh, instruction set. Um, but again, for a similar kind of thing. So, so the, the, the resulting, you might have a direct or indirect um, address being specified where the result should go. So you first have to calculate that um, um, effective address and then do the actual storing of the operand. And you're basically done. So kind of like like we talked before with our fetch execute, you know, um, we would check for our interrupts um, and then go back and, and get ready to do the next fetch. Right? So potentially there's lots of steps um, that we can break this down into. And, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, if, if you actually uh, looked at real CPU design, you know, you know, so, you know probably gets even really more fine grain than this and kind of descriptions that the designers of, of, of these kinds of steps and things. Um, so most, most of the questions really kind of um, on the, this problem set are about instruction pipelining and then also about calculating um, the uh, the speed up that you get, right? So I'll spend most of my time talking about that here um, today. So most modern CPUs make use of pipelining. Um, um, it's a performance enhancing, you know, uh, design mechanism. Um, you know, we, we've talked about some others, you know, so, so that there's, there's lots of strategies that, that CPU designers use in order to increase performance. So, um, you know, um, um, adding cache uh, in order to decrease the, the, the memory bottleneck. Um, and um, you know, we've talked about some others. So, so, so this is another one. Um, the basic insight for pipelining is that um, um, the, 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 these steps that we break the, uh, you know, the, the, the fetch and execute of an instruction down to can take many CPU cycles, right? So, so typically um, on, on um, an Intel or, or an, an ARM CPU, and the instruction is not going to be able to execute all of these parts in one clock cycle, right? So, so uh, it's going to take multiple clock cycles, and 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 typically, you know, the, these are broken down so that uh, each one of these steps um, um, can be done within one clock cycle. Um, you know, that's being a little bit simplistic, but but that that's kind of um, what happens here, right? So, but that means then a typical instruction would take multiple clock cycles. And so if, if each instruction, we had to, to, to do all of the steps for the instruction before we could do the next instruction, um, that, that would mean that um, 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 every instruction, you know, um, uh, uh, would take uh, multiple clock cycles to complete, right? Um, so, so, Pipelining is really just a it's, a, it's a parallel, it's a way to parallelize things, right? So what we're, all we're doing for, for pipelining is we're 
executing multiple of those different stages of instruction execution in parallel, right? So the inside, and, and like they say here, I mean, I, I basically think of pipeline just as, uh, you know, it's basically like an assembly line, right? Um, so the analogy is, is a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you're seeing that concept in manufacturing, we're kind of doing the same thing um, um, to pipeline instruction, right? So instead of waiting for instruction to to be fetched, to go through all those cycles, to write out the result before we can start the next instruction in parallel while one instruction you know, um, is being decoded, uh, we might be fetching the next instruction, right? And so on, right? Um, so, the, I mean, the, the simplest, um, I mean, even if you go back and just think of an instruction as having um, two parts, a, a fetch part and an execute part, um, you could still uh, begin to pipeline, um, you know, build a pipelined um, uh, CPU architecture, e even if you only have two stages, uh, fetch and execute. And that, that's really what the first question um, for the problem set is about, right? So I, I just asked on the first one um, to uh, think of a two-stage pipeline. So, so basically just fetch and execute um, uh, and, and do the figure 16.10. Um, oh, by the way, I, 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 I had the, the numbers wrong in there. Hopefully that won't confuse anybody, but yeah, I was referring to these, all these were from chapter 16 for the, um, version of the textbook that we're supposed to be using in the, the class this semester. Yeah, yeah. so uh, those were fixed, but I'm sure a lot of people downloaded it where it said 14, but yeah, I meant 16 for those. Anybody's watching this after the fact. Um, so yeah, for, for this first one, I'm just kind of really looking for the same kind of diagram, but um, where we where you know, just draw it out for two instructions. For, for four instructions with two cycles, just a basic fetch and execute. So the first one could be relatively simple for most people, I think. Um, but the point, of, of, you know, before I kind of go on for this, you know, what this illustrates is um, if we ignore kind of all the complications, you know, so this is kind of in a perfect world. Um, if, if pipelines always were able to execute everything uh, in parallel, um, all stages of the um, the, the um, instruction execution could, could be successfully executed in parallel. You would get a speed up like this, right? So you know these nine instructions. Uh, each one of these are supposed to be represented, but each stage of the uh, instruction execution takes one clock cycle, right? So so in theory, it takes six cycles to execute each instruction, um, but um, um, to execute, so, so to execute these nine instructions, if we weren't doing any pipeline, if we weren't doing anything in parallel, would actually take a full 54, you know, six times nine um, instruction uh, clock cycles to execute all of these, right? So in, in theory, though, pipelining basically allows us, to, so even though individual instructions take multiple clock cycles, um, if, if everything is being pipelined perfectly, uh, we were effectively able to almost execute one instruction every clock cycle with a good pipeline like this, right? With the caveat that uh, we have to kind of feed the, the pipeline initially. So, so there's a, um, um, a formula later on, but as you can see, so for nine instructions, it actually takes 14 cycles total, right? So, so it's really about nine cycles plus um, uh, it's actually the, the number of cycles minus one that you have to add on to that is kind of overhead, right? So, so it's nine plus six minus one, so nine plus five or 14 cycle. Um, but that basic holds it. So, you know, again, if, if we didn't have any interruptions for this perfect parallelism here, uh, you know, it, it, if you executed a thousand instructions, it would take effectively a thousand clock cycles um, to execute them, you know, plus plus five more cycles, which is pretty much like just a thousand plus a little bit more, right? Um, 
but that is um, I mean that that's that's in theory a, a big performance boost here right so um, um, for a non-pipelined architecture The the, um, the the performance is going to be significantly less um, if we're executing only one instruction every six cycles or, or whatever um, is the, the the basic um, amount of time that we need for our instructions here, right? So, um, so Question two then, and, and kind of after that here um, in our textbook though, is that, you know, this, this kind of ideal um, parallel execution um, in, in, in practice, uh, you'll never get um, uh, things to work out like this, at least not for an extended amount of time, okay? So, so there's lots of reasons why, um, um, you're not going to always be able to execute all these stages uh, in parallel here. And, and that's kind of what most of the rest of the, the textbook talks about um, after this part in um, section four here in chapter 16 is, is all the ways that um, um, this kind of breaks down. Yeah. All right. So the first one that's introduced is um, um, the effect of uh, conditional branching um, on the instruction uh, pipeline operation. That, and that's really what the, the, the second question is about. So basically to draw a similar one to this figure here, where we have a, um, an example of a branch, uh, a conditional branch happening. So, um, so the reason why this is problematic is because, uh, so, so here on the figure 1611, um, Instruction three was basically a conditional jump, okay? And, and what happened was that once we got to the execute stage, we found out that uh, we weren't, that we, we were gonna take the jump and we're gonna jump and start executing instruction 15 um, instead of not taking the jump. So, so if we didn't take the jump, we would have continued sequential execution and executed the next instruction after three. So execute instruction four. But, but um, um, whatever the conditional jump was for instruction three, we ended up taking it, right? So what happens though, is that we don't know until we actually finish the execution of the instruction, whether we're going to change the program counter um, and, and you know, jump to execute a different instruction or whether we're not gonna take the, the conditional jump and we're just gonna execute the next instruction, right? So depending on you know, the, the result of executing that conditional branch, uh, two things can happen um, at clock cycle eight here. Or, well, you know, we can start executing uh, either instruction four or, or continue executing instruction four, or we need to jump and start executing instruction 15, right? So um, as the textbook discusses, um, I mean, there's there's nothing that you can do to get around this, right? So so well, um, um, there there's complex things that that uh, modern CPUs do. They they try to maybe predict, you know, uh, uh, which branch might be taken um, and other things here. That, that's kind of discussed later on um, in this section here. Um, but at a most fundamental, you know, so, so what most CPUs do, I mean, they do assume that we're going to not take the branch. We're just going to execute the next instruction sequentially, and they continue feeding the pipeline um, after that. But when we get to the actual finishing of the execution of the, the conditional um, jump instruction, um, we know whether we can continue executing instruction four, or we have to kind of throw out that work. So, so um, in this case, some work was being done by the CPU. All, all of these um, filled-in squares here were, um, ex, you know, we're starting to work on the execution of instruction four, five, six, and seven. But we, we we're going to end up branching over those and not actually executing those. Okay, so so in some sense, this is a bit wasted work. But of course, this is being done in parallel. Uh, with the other stuff here, but 
um, um, in any case, so, so um, um, if, if we do have a conditional jump, we just have to throw away that work uh, and the PC will get updated um, and then we will start filling in the, 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 um, the, the pipeline um, again from that instruction that we jumped to. So, um, so here, I mean, in fact, we didn't actually end up executing the instruction. So we actually only executed instruction one, two, three and then um, this diagram is showing the, the completion of the, the first three instructions plus the completion of instruction 15 and 16 um, after we branched here. So, so we, we, we executed five instructions, but it took, took us a total of 14 time steps, right? Where previously we had executed nine instructions um, in that total of 14 time steps, right? So, so uh, we, we, we had quite a few less and we were able to, to finish quite a few less instructions because of that um, um, conditional jump in here and that we weren't able to, you know, uh, do, you know, keep the pipeline full and, and be doing things in parallel, right? So, you know, here at time eight, um, you know, we'll, well, we kind of threw, threw away all this work um, and we no longer had, you know, um, six things being done in parallel. Right. We had to throw that away and we have to kind of go back and refill up the pipeline here. So every time a conditional jump happens, um, that's going to happen to, to your pipeline. Right? And there's kind of, well, there are some ways you can mitigate that. So, so instead of um, just um, pipelining in the next instruction, you can try and predict ahead of time. Um, whether you're going to branch or not, um, and then uh, fill in with your prediction instead of always filling in the next instruction. Um, but as you can imagine, I mean, you know, uh, that kind of prediction, um, um, maybe, you know, you, you can do better than a 50 50 chance, but, um, but uh, you can't do much better than that. So it doesn't help a lot to try and branch prediction. Um, So yeah, I don't want to jump ahead and talk about it. There's some other things I've talked about of, of some ways you can try and um, reduce that. So, but it, it comes down to that um, um, the amount of speed up that you can get um, is not a straightforward function of, um, of, of your pipeline. You have, you have to keep, you have to take into account how much branching a typical program has and how often it's going to do a conditional jump because right? every time a conditional jump occurs you have to uh, restart filling in the pipeline right so if you're doing too much conditional jumping you, you kind of end up losing a lot of if not all of the uh, benefits of this parallelizing the um, um, uh, uh, cpu execution of the different stages of your instructions here. Um, so yeah, I mean, question two though that was was really kind of asking you to um, basically do another one of these kinds of diagrams, uh, but where you have a um, uh, a conditional branch uh, occurring. Um, so with a sequence of seven instructions in which the third instruction is a branch that is taken. Um, uh, Um, I, um, I, I didn't specify here, I guess, but um, um, you should go ahead and, and assume that um, the, uh, the the third instruction is a branch that's taken to um, the instruction um, like eight, the, the one after the seven instructions that you're given here um, when you're filling out this diagram for uh, part two. Um, I think that's what, what I was intending on that one. 
Um, so yeah, for those first few questions, you could have something similar to 16, 10, or 11, or you could do it this way too. Um, um, so um, if that's easier for you to understand, but uh, either way, I think these are equivalent. This is just um, um, having time going this way um, and kind of emphasizing the, the different stages versus this one where you have time going from left to right and you're emphasizing um, the uh, instructions uh, and then the stages of each instruction. Um, Okay, so that was kind of the first few questions. Um, so let's talk about kind of the, the, the calculations for the speed up here um, a little bit. So, so the last two are really mostly about um, uh, the performance description um, that's talked about um, uh, still in the, the section four here um, of the textbook. So, um, really, um, although, again, as usual, my formatting on my my electronic version of my textbook is a little bit messed up. Let me get my notes here real quick. So um, this discussion about speed up, I mean, this is really uh, an application of the um, uh, uh, Amdahl's law on speed up, right? So, so it's, it's really just the, uh, the you know, down here, it's really just the ratio of, uh, of a system where there's only, uh, where K is one. So that means a pipeline with just one stage, which is essentially a non-pipeline system. That's kind of what the top is on the speed up. So, so that's the unimproved time divided by uh, the ratio of that to the, the time where it's been improved, where, where performance has been sped up, right? So where, where you have a pipeline of some K steps, whatever the number of steps are, right? So um, to, to back off on that, um, um, so for the lack of questions, you know, there's some notation here, but it's, it's um, um, uh, when you dig into it, it's not too complex. Uh, this is this is the one that I was referring to, right? So, so tau again is really just a constant that's supposed to indicate the amount of time that uh, the the largest one of those site uh, not not cycles, but the largest one of those stages takes when you're doing the pipeline. Because basically, in order to parallelize um, an execution like this. You know, so so in in actuality, like the um, the the decode stage might take less time than the um, um, what was the CO the um, um, calculate operand stage, right? So so some of these might take more or less than the other than than others, right? So 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 um, and it can actually vary depending on the instruction. So sometimes, you know, the decode or the, the calculate operands can be simple if you're using direct addressing, but it could take time, more time if you're doing a more complex um, 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 operand um, um, representation, right, to, to, to calculate the operand. So, um, so what I'm getting at is, is, yeah, I mean, these can vary, but um, all we're saying on here is that whichever one is the largest of those, that's effectively what we're going to have to set the clock cycle time um, for the CPU. Um, so in that case, you know, some of these steps might be done quickly. Uh, so some of these stages um, might be done quickly and others might take most all of the clock cycle time, but you have to have the clock cycle time be as large as whatever the largest um, one of those 
stages is, right? So that's really all that tau is, right? So uh, given that, then um, uh, then the, the expression here is really just the, the number of, um, uh, the, the, the total time required for a pipeline with k stages. So, so we already we already discussed that, right? So if I have k stages, I effectively um, and, and and n is the number of instructions that we have here. Um, So, um, you know, so, so if I have a thousand instructions, um, it's basically going to take, uh, and, and, you know, a pipeline of, of like, um, uh, like uh, six stages, like, like we were doing for this figure 16 here, or, you know, like, like in this case, if I have nine instructions and, and, and um, a pipeline with six stages, it's going to basically take approximately nine clock cycles plus a little bit extra. So, so nine, it actually takes, uh, so by this equation, um, um, the, the, the correct thing is you take the, the number of instructions minus one, then you add in the, the number of stages and that will give you, right? So, so that will give you the, the 14 in this case, right? So, and that's just a count of the number of instructions that it would take um, to execute, the, the, the number of clock cycles it would take to execute uh, some number of instructions given a pipeline of some number of stages. Um, and again, that assumes that we have perfect uh, execution of the pipeline. So the pipeline doesn't get interrupted. So, so that's, that's what this basic um, formula is in here. And of course, if you can calculate the number of clock cycles, then if you know how long each, each, what, what each clock cycle takes, which is what tau is, you can calculate the total time, which is what what the T was from the textbook. But anyway, you know, so, so uh, 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 if you compare that time to the time when you don't have a pipeline, or you can think of that as having a pipeline with just a single stage, which is effectively no pipeline, that, that gives you an expression for the speed up um, that you can expect, um, you know, for some number of instructions, for a pipeline of some number of stages, K is the, the number of stages in the pipeline here. Um, um, it does, but, but so where it, where it comes in, well, um, it doesn't affect the speed up. Yeah, so, so it wouldn't because uh, we're, we're assuming that both the, the um, um, in this particular formula here, we're, we're assuming that both the um, um, pipeline with one stage or the pipeline with K stages um, is being done on a CPU with the same um, um, speed, basically. Right? So, so yeah, I mean, if you're comparing CPUs, uh, different CPUs, um, um, you would have to keep that tau in there because your tau might be different uh, on, on your one CPU versus the other. So, yeah. But yeah, it basically comes, it basically um, factors out in this case, because we're assuming tau is, is the same, both for the unimproved and the, the, the pipeline version here. So if that's not the case, you would have to keep that in there. Um, but yeah, this, this allows you to calculate the speed. I mean, you know, so uh, uh, real quick, I already, already kind of said what the speed up was here. So, you know, if, if, if we weren't pipelining this. In effect, this would take 54 um, clock cycles, where the clock cycle tau is whatever the clock cycle is, right? Um, like a, a microsecond or, or whatever the, the clock cycle is. But um, with, with our six stage pipeline, it only takes 14. So the speed up is um, uh, 54 divided by 14. So, it, it, which is basically going to be close to a six times speed up since we have a six. Um, you know, so if it was if it was fifty four divided by nine, you know, so if it only took nine clock cycles, we have exactly a six times speed up, right? Does that, does that make sense? So, I mean, that's kind of you know, kind of a subtle thing, but it's important, right? So, so for the the the, um, the the nine instructions here, we get we get a speed up unimproved would be fifty four by fourteen. But if we had like a thousand instructions, um, so this was just the nine, but 
put in a thousand instructions um, effectively. Of course, the top would be a thousand times six. So you want to take six thousand clock cycles times tau, whatever the, the time is. And then the bottom though would, would effectively take a thousand minus one plus six. But that's effectively, you know, so, so the, the, the larger the number of instructions where, where you don't get the pipeline interrupted, the closer you get to the theoretical speed up. So the theoretical speed up is going to be, if I have a, a pipeline of six steps, it's six times faster. Right? Because, because again, effectively, if we don't have a pipeline, um, it takes six clock cycles to execute every instruction. But with a pipeline, um, as long as the pipeline can keep going, we're going to approach executing one instruction every cycle instead of one instruction every six cycles. So that's why we get six times speed. And, and effectively, right, so the, the textbook discusses this a bit. Um, so in theory, um, like if I can make a 20-stage pipeline, I could get a 20 times improvement. In theory, right, and 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 you, know, you can imagine you keep doing that, but uh, uh, most real CPUs don't have pipelines like of twenty or thirty or fifty stages, the, and there's reasons why. Um, um, the, and our, our textbook discusses that. Um, so there there is some overhead for designing this. So so at some point the overhead for being able to uh, move the data from uh, you know, the results from this stage to, to be given in the next stage and things like that would become bigger than the um, uh, improvements that you're getting um, from adding in extra stages and things like that. So, so there is some effective limits. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know how many stages like typically Intel might have or an ARM, but it's probably like uh, you know eight or 10 or something like that similar to kind of what our textbook describes here. Um, um, so anyway, that um, really, I think is what you mostly need for the question three. Um, So in that one, you're given the information like the number of stages is five. Um, and um, here, right, we're kind of ignoring um, um, the, the, the things that happen if branches happen or, or, um, um, or if you have other things that keep you from uh, being able to execute some stages in parallel, so having to uh, uh, push some of the calculations around. Um, so the first one was kind of the thing that I was just talking about, um, uh, just calculating the, uh, the speed up. Um, compared to a non-pipeline processor. Um, oh, but yeah, so, so this one is different because the, the pipeline processor um, has a uh, no, that's, that's, no, ignore that. So, so yeah, so, so you are given a clock rate uh, and you're given the number of instructions uh, in one and a half million instructions. So um, you should be able to calculate the speed up um, um, pretty um, directly from that. And then the, the, the through, throughputs in instructions per second, um, uh, then you would have to go back and use the, the clock rate for that. So um, in that case, um, um, you know, you, you should effectively be able to get one instruction per cycle, um, which should lead you to be able to figure out what the, um, uh, the throughput is um, on this one. Um, so 
And then um, for the fourth question, um, so to we throw in um, um, the wrinkle that, that yeah, in this one, kind of like we were talking about, um, we are comparing two different CPUs now that have um, 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 slightly different clock speeds and things. So, so you will have to take those into account, right? So we, we've got um, a, a processor that's um, not pipeline that has a particular clock rate. Um, and that would, would, would tell you uh, how many, on average, um, how many cycles it takes for each instruction to execute. Um, but then we have another one um, that, that runs at a slightly reduced clock rate. Um, um, but um, um, is pipelined. So, so with five, uh, with a K set to five, so five stage pipeline. Um, so in that case, um, you know, you'll want to um, keep the, 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 the clock speed, keep that tau in there when you're calculating the, uh, the speed up in order to do it correctly. Um, and since they aren't the same in this case, um, but the, and then then yeah like kind of like for the previous one you should be able to work back then what the um, instruction per second or million instruction per second is for each of those as well from that um, basic information. Um, all right. So yeah, but uh, but yeah, most of those questions then were all kind of coming from the discussion of the textbook on the performance section here. Um, um, I'll just mention a few more things, and then I'll see if there's anything else. Uh, you guys want to um, discuss here. So uh, there are there are more um, things than just branch instructions that can cause um, you know the the having to uh, that that you can't keep the pipeline going um, um, in parallel execution. So so effectively branching or calling a function, which is another kind of branch, but um, uh, well, calling a function is, is, is more like a, um, 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 an, an absolute jump. Uh, if there's a function call, you're always going to take it. So um, uh, you can kind of make um, a prediction on a function call um, or a procedure call. Um, where you can't really do it on a conditional branch, but but interrupts interrupts are effectively like uh, um, conditional jumps, right? So you, you don't know when an interrupt is going to occur. So if an interrupt does occur while you're doing some processing, that effectively changes the program counter um, to something different from uh, what you're expecting. So at that point. You know, to handle an interrupt, you're going to have to flush out the pipeline once you start, once you jump down and start um, working on the interrupt. Um, uh, but there are others. So, so you know, the, the textbook talks about pipeline heads. Most of these have to do with dependencies on uh, either like, so resource hazards. Um, so the difference between resource hazards and um, data hazards is resource hazards is, is conceptually is when um, um, and you've got things that need the same resource. So if, if um, uh, like, like the textbook describes, uh, like, like some of these stages, like uh, fetching the operands or writing the operands have to, to do um, a access of memory. And if the system can only handle one thing at a time, accessing the bus in order to transfer data to or from memory, then uh, you might not be able to do um, um, 
those kinds of stages in parallel um, if they're occurring on a pipeline. So, so I didn't quite agree with this figure on the textbook. Um, so so the, the, the textbook was saying that, that the fetch instruction, you know, um, can need memory access because you are fetching instructions from memory, the same as the fetching of the operand and the writing of the operand, um, right? So, so decoding um, and um, executing um, don't need memory access, but potentially fetching uh, the instruction or fetching the operand or writing the resulting operand might need a reader or write to memory. So, so the, the textbook going to discuss that, um, you know, so, so in that case, we might not be able to fetch the operand and uh, fetch instruction three at the same time. So we'd, we'd have to delay. So that, that's an example of a resource um, um, hazard or um, resource. But um, you know, here, potentially, though, there's more. You know, so again, uh, three of the textbook didn't, didn't discuss it, but you know, if this fetch of this operand also needs to go to memory, we might have to also delay still some more, right? Uh, the same reason why, why we might have had to delay um, um, on clock cycle three, we might have to delay on, on clock cycle four for those. And, and still even here, because there's also a right. So, so I might potentially have to write. You might not have to. So that's one thing um, about these hazards is that um, uh, these stages, depending on the instructions, may or may not actually need the memory access, right? So if we're fetching an operand from a register, we wouldn't have to go out to memory. So, so, so if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a register um, um, addressing mode instead of a, a a memory, a direct or indirect addressing mode. You know, then, then you could do those in parallel, which is you know, maybe, for example, maybe is what happens here, one, one of these ones. Or, or this fetch was from a register. So, so we could go ahead and do that. Um, and fetch, um, I'd play a different fetching instruction. Um, but anyway, so, so, so that's kind of resources, but you can also have particular um, dependencies on data. So this was a good example. Um, you know, so this bit of code, um, we were adding two registers and putting the result in the EAX into the A register, but then we're using register A again in a calculation, putting the result in C. So yeah, I mean, if you, if you looked at the, the cycles here, the problem being that, um, um, you don't know the value of, of A until you're done completely executing this instruction here, right? So you really can't uh, fetch the value of A for the second instruction um, until we completed uh, the, 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 the adding and then the writing of that back out um, um, to the A there. So, you know, that's, that's an example of, of a, a data dependency or data hazard. Yeah, and as, I, as we had in our quiz, you know, there, you know there, there's other kinds of things, but, but this, is, this is kind of the more common. Let's say, um, I think that's an RAW, you read after write. So, you know, we need to read this value back. We need to make certain that the read of the value um, doesn't happen until the write of that result finished from some other um, calculations being done in our pipeline here. Um, uh, oh, well, control, I mean, the, uh, the, the jumping um, conditional branches, um, you know, we've already talked about those. Those, those are, 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 are very common too. Um, um, but uh, the yeah, our textbook calls those control hazards. So, and this is this is where um, our textbook talked a little bit about dealing with branches. So, um, yeah. So I don't know how common these are. You know, well, like I, I, I'm mostly familiar with like branch prediction, um, which you know um, has limitations. Um, like like another thing, you could try and actually um, have multiple streams. So you, so you could have one pipeline 
doing it as if the branch went one way and one pipeline doing it as if the branch went the other way, right? But of course, that, that starts to make your architecture real complex. Um, um, you have to have a lot of circuitry to, to be able to support multiple streams. And then, and then of course, if you run across then a second branch instruction, um, you know, uh, you, can't, you can't start having, you know, you have to start creating more and more streams in order to handle more and more branches in parallel. So, um, Okay. Yeah, and and you know, like I said, I don't think I'm gonna go into to too much more here. I mean, um, there is um, some examples of, of these things on the uh, Intel 86 and the ARM, um, which you definitely should uh, read through. So it talks about um, some of the organization of um, of um, Doesn't uh, yeah, the one thing that, that disappointed me a little bit about this is that it um, um, uh, talks some more about some of the, the architecture for the um, registers and things like that, but doesn't go a lot into like kind of the, how, the, the, the what sort of pipeline is that. Although the, the, the best, um, there is this, a little discussion about the uh, the, the 486 uh, pipelining, and 486 is a little bit of an older processor um, uh, in here, um, which is a good thing to go through, though, as, as you know, kind of an example of, of, of real sort of stages in, in a real processor um, that was given. I've given it in the uh, section four still, I believe, where it talked a little bit about the 486 um, pipeline. Thank you at the moment. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, let's let's go ahead and uh, end the session there. Then I guess so. Um, unless you guys have any um, questions about things, uh, but uh, but yeah, that's kind of all I wanted to talk about for the, um, the problem set questions. So hopefully that should be enough to get people going on those. All right. Well, I kind of try to say something sure. before I make a question. Um, uh, regarding uh, next semester courses, because uh, I know that you're offering um, a machine learning course, mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, I guess it got really cool. So I was just wondering if uh, perhaps other section you were going to open and what you want to add more seats. Machine learning, um, uh, they haven't talked about it. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's going to be more on that one. What What do you suggest I can do? Because that, that's like one of the last classes I'm doing. Um, like I, I'm, I only have three classes left, um, and so I was just wondering if anything could be done. Who, like, what, who could I talk 